Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, press conference from the fourth day of the 49th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Thank you for joining us here in the room. Thank you for joining us uh, on the live stream, whether you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, or on our website. We're happy you're tuning in. If you're watching from Europe, uh, good afternoon. If you're watching from the US, good morning. If you're watching from China, you should probably be in bed by now, uh, but we're still happy you're here. Um, you're joining the press conference titled, Cleaning Up the Battery Boom. It's quite a dramatic title, um, but you'll see as we hear from our panelists any moment now that it's also quite a topic that requires this sense of urgency. Um, allow me to introduce the wonderful panel uh, to you uh, that uh, will help cleaning up the battery boom. Uh, to my immediate left, we're joined by Martin Brudermüller, the chairman of the board of executive directors and chief technology officer of BASF uh, from, from Germany. Uh, we're also joined by Lin Bo Chiang to his immediate left, who is uh, the Dean of the China Institute for Studies in Energy Policy of the Xiamen University. Um, right at the heart and center of our panel, we're joined tonight by Christina lampe onerud the founder and chief executive of Cadenza Innovation based in the US. And Ricardo, uh, last uh, but definitely not least, we're joined by you, Ricardo Politi, the Senior Director for Energy and Extractives of the World Bank uh, Group. So we're very pleased to have uh, in classical forum uh, uh, style a multi-stakeholder panel to address these questions. Uh, Martin, without further ado, let me hand over to you and let's hear from you um, how can we clean up this battery boom? How can the Global Battery Alliance, where you play an important role, uh, help to do this? And what's the role of BSF? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, as you said, I'm CEO and CTO of BSF, which is the largest chemical company in the world. I'm also co-chairing the Global Battery Alliance. Uh, the battery area is one of the largest innovation areas for the chemical industry. And this is also why my company is engaged in innovation in battery materials. Well, I mean, we talk about the battery boom. I think the success of the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, if we want to really make this a success, we have to tap into all potentials uh, possible and all, take all efforts. And I think definitely a transformative shift uh, to decarbonize the energy and the transport um, systems is an absolutely must to do this. And that requires battery technologies to be established as a core of this um, as a core technology, and we have also to massively increase the renewable energy. There is a lot of speculation going on how fast that is, but uh, the best guess is in 2050, uh, the uh, electric value or the e electric vehicle market will be worth more than two trillion US dollars. And that will also mean that we need a global cumulative energy storage deployment, which is maybe 30 fold from what it is today. This needs a deliberate uh, interaction uh, to fully use the potential of batteries to support really the sustainable development and the climate change mit mitigation because it's a rather complex uh, value chain. What we need is we need a sustainable and low carbon um, value chain for batteries. So you have to take care about the working conditions and sorts of poverty and the social and environment concerns that come with it mainly through the raw material supply chain. We talk here about cobalt from the uh, Republic of uh, Congo. We have also to structure the battery production uh, with its footprint uh, to life cycle impacts, the carbon balance, and also um, have to define standards and regulation to cater that we really harvest uh, the full opportunities for helping the clima climate mitigation. The Global Battery Alliance um, is taking care about all these aspects. It's trying to structure uh, the value chain. It was founded in uh, September in 2017. Uh, we have now gained a lot of speed because it is a fully operational organization with the secretariat uh, that is hosted by the um, WEF. And um, we have now started basically from a small number of um, members at the beginning. We are very proud that we have now more than 40 members. And actually here in Davos, three more members have committed to join the Global Battery Alliance. It's the Volvo Group, it's Cadenza Innovation, and it's Climate Works uh, Formation. So we have very well structured what we want to do. We have clear objectives for this year and the next years. And what it comes now to come from talk to action. And this is why the members have to facilitate in alliance with the Global Battery Alliance here, uh, new projects and to, to really make it happen. Give you one example, what my com company BASF committed with 
car producer BMW and also Samsung SDI and Samsung Electronics in cooperation with uh, GIS, this GIZ, this is the Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. We are taking care to structure and uh, mobilize uh, along the raw material chain of cobalt. Uh, we have been targeting uh, that we improve the artisanal um, working conditions uh, along this. So there will be many more projects to come. I have to say we have a very positive momentum in this, in this moment. Um, and that needs to be sustained in 2019 and 2020. And what we want to do to give this another impulse is actually that the Global um, Battery Alliance uh, and Supervisory Council has decided and committed here in Davos to mobilize and publish um, a pledge uh, which uh, clearly al aligns and, and brings the, the Global Battery Alliance forward, which should be signed for 50 CEOs and also leaders of other institutions and stakeholders along the value chain. And I think with this, uh, we are very well positioned to gain speed, uh, to gain actions, and uh, I think we are very good on track to make an impact. Thank you very much. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, not just the batteries are booming, but also the global battery lines. That's uh, definitely good news that here in Davos we could sign up three more members. Uh, Lin Boichang, uh, I will make you work uh, twice as hard as every other panelist in the sense that I'm s asking you two questions. So my first question would be, um, uh, about energy storage. Obviously, that's one of the areas where you are uh, like a proven expert. So we'd like to hear from you which role does energy storage play here in the battery boom and how can it help to solve some of the challenges? And also, uh, secondly, what's the role of China in these developments? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we know that the, 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 the climate change and sustainable development is very important and critical to us uh, at this point. And uh, battery play a very important role in the future energy system. Let me give you a few lines of uh, how important could it be. Uh, for example, uh, we know that the, the, the transportation sector is one of the most difficult sectors to reduce the emission uh, at, up to this point and to improve the efficiency. Now, the, about 60% of the gasoline, no, about 60% of the oil was consumed by, by vehicles. And uh, it actually, vehicle really provide the, the, the alternative to substitute the oil uh, moving forward. And battery is a critical point of electric vehicle. Next is the storage. Uh, we know that the, the solar cost uh, has been reduced substantially over the last few years. Uh, let's say in China, the solar cost reduced by 90% in about 10 years' time. The wind reduced by 50%. Right now, both solar and wind are quite competitive and can actually compete with the coal fire in many places in China. Um, but it's still a small percentage. Once it become a larger percentage, then the system stability and everything become a, become a critical, uh, important for the for the large scale development of wind and solar. And here is the battery storage, and the storage come into the picture. Now by, let's say that, let's move forward uh, with the distribution uh, such that we can uh, together with the storage. And many, believe, many people believe that the cost is still pretty far away. That's actually not true. Because the uh, cost of distribution uh, together with the battery in China is pretty close to the commercial tariff in China. So that's feasible. Uh, at this point, we need to try harder moving forward uh, to improve it. The next night is that the, the, can we imagine that we go home and plug in the, the, the electric vehicle and set it at 12 midnight and take it out at about 6 in the morning. And that's very good for the, for the whole entire electric, electricity system. It can improve system efficiency. Because for China, we are only, the extension only consume 12%, less than 12% of electricity. While the United States consume more than 40% of electricity. So, residential. So, moving forward, we know that the residential from China is going to consume more electricity. And that means the peak electricity demand will, will increase dramatically. So, we need that to utilize this, this, uh, this capacity in the in the in the during the during the the, the, the low low time 
such that the whole system efficiency can be improved dramatically. So I, I, I move to the, uh, I really emphasize the importance of the, of the, uh, of the storage and the, and the battery in, the, in several areas. Let's now move to the, the China's uh, role in the, in, the, in the battery development and, and in, that, in, that, in, in several areas. In, in 2018, the China built and, and also under construction roughly 200 gigawatt hours of capacity. The global demand is only about 70 gigawatt hours. So there's a huge capacity built up. Because of the scale of the capacity, the cost dropped dramatically. Over the last three years, the cost is down by roughly 60%. And that really reflects in several numbers. So one is that electric vehicle last year, China saw roughly one million union, and that's roughly 50% incremental. This year, many people expect that 2019, we're going to double into two million units. And by 2025, it's a good possibility that majority of incre incrementals is coming from electric vehicle. And we saw every year, in recent year, 24 million union of the vehicles every year. So that, that, that is a very substantial. So the, 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 on the storage side, the, the, the large, largest 10 uh, battery company, seven in China, the largest one that, that is a CATL, last year on the storage side, the energy storage side, the sales increased by 10 times. So the, that all the indications uh, indicate that, that you know, it's a dramatic build-up of the capacity and the dramatic uh, build-up of the, of the downstream that such that we can utilize the, 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 the battery capacity very quickly. Now let me also uh, mention a couple of points that uh, moving forward, what we need to do. One is that uh, we need to design the policy that's uh, comprehensive and coordinated because right now that we come up with all kinds of policies like supporting uh, solar, supporting wind, and you know, we also come up with something to support uh, the electric vehicle. But those policies, uh, in fact, that's not only for China, it's for all other countries. Uh, they do not have a comprehensive design such that we don't create a waste. We have a build up a huge capacity upstream, but it's not much capacity downstream or not much consumer downstream. So that created the, the waste. That's one is that the policy design from government need to be changed comprehensively. Second is that uh, this is a global issue, climate change. We need a global approach. Uh, that means that the countries need to cooperate together in terms of technology, in terms of investment. Uh, for example, if China willing to provide a very low cost of the battery, why not utilize it? Yeah. So uh, we, we really need uh, the, the international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Christina, you're somewhat of a miracle. You're by far the youngest panelist here today, but you, you still managed to have oh, somewhat of 20 years of experience in, in, the, in the battery space. Um, we, we'll solve that miracle another time, but let's hear from you a little bit the longer term perspective here on these battery developments. Obviously, batteries have been around for, for a while. Um, how do you how do you see these developments over years? And if I, I might kind of put you on the spot, how do you predict the the the, the uh, trend going forward? Please. Yeah, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are so excited from the battery industry in general, having lived through the revolution of mobility and mobile technology with cell phone technologies going. Oh, year over year, a doubling of capacity and basically adjusting costs to becoming a consumer good. Having been part of the laptop industry as it went from an hour runtime to four hour runtime, from basically having to replace your batteries every six to 12 months to now have batteries that last the life of the device, also coming down in consumer costs. So the battery industry focused now very much on lithium ion battery technology, which is something consumers are quite familiar with. You use them today still in consumer electronics with emerging electric vehicles. And the opportunity for grid is unbelievably interesting. And of course, very challenging. 
we're lucky to be at a place as an industry with 30 years experience. The lithium ion technology was really invented in the 70s, but got into mass production through Japanese initiatives, and the Koreans and the Chinese followed, and now the United States is also following in, in nice step. But the opportunity now to use knowledge for 30 years and deploy it on scale to be part of a solution to climate change where battery technology has to learn from the consumer and mobility era into what is going to be our biggest challenge, which is electricity and access to electricity in fast developing economic regions. The technology per se is well known and well understood, as is the manufacturing processes. Of course, there's room for improvement, but the opportunity to do this at the scale uh, will demand quite a bit of collaboration, not only across boundaries, but also across partners that traditionally have never worked together. So we're touching not the paradigm of consumer electronics, where the battery industry had the luxury of saying, here's my battery, please use it in your device. There is a need now for collaboration where we set the specs together, where we basically fine tune the operating window through chemistry, and we take it through into a cell design that matches very, very closely what the device actually is meant to power. And when those devices become interactive, key feature of how we see electricity in the old paradigm, traditional paradigm of centralized power generation and take that into the distributed era with a lot of renewables, which will happen over the next 30, 50 years. It is very important that data gets a seat at the table, that we uh, collectively decide a, a good pace for distribution and opportunity, and yet that we all raise the bar for urgency. It's very, very urgent. Call to action. The opposite is, is really not that pretty. And the good news is we can deploy with batteries a lot of the solving features in the climate change puzzle we can participate actively in peak shaving. You can basically enable distributed energy in high energy demand and basically allow for electricity and gain access to electricity in countries that do not have that frequently deployed. So the opportunity is massive. The level of innovation that will now go into the product and the definition of the problem we're used to basically seeing where we had used to maybe five years to define the problem and another 10 years to mature a product, we don't have that time. So being here in Davos with World Economic Forum, debating the energy paradigm at the same time seeing the battery industry being a key contributor is of course immensely exciting. And the guiding light uh, remains Cost is really, really important, and it has to be cost for the system. So that touches everything from materials, how we source, how we use, how we process them, into cells and the design for those cells, how we then take the cells and put them into packs and then install them in what will become fairly large installations at points, basically the size of this room and beyond, and how we control that. The era of digitalization will help immensely learning how to deploy energy and how to source energy, the onset of blockchain, so much exciting technology happening at the same time. And all of this is going to drive basically use cost to an affordability price. It is interesting, of course, to note we already have case studies where battery technology is the enabling technology to put in distributed energy storage or energy distribution, basically, and energy generation, which is renewable and sustainable, which is cheaper than traditional sources. So there's not one size fits all. There's not one solution for the call to action for climate change. Nor is there one way to generate green jobs and opportunities for economic growth, but lots of different opportunities and lots of different solutions. So if cost is the number one guide, number two becomes safety and reliability. So the way, again, to stream more communication. What is the spec? How are we doing this? And how do we make sure it meets the problem statement? And the third time, of course, is energy density. We are in an era of urbanization. So energy has to come closer to the user, which also increases some of the efficiency. 
So by driving and basically developing more compact solutions that ultimately are easier to integrate into large systems where you have an opportunity to put basically 20, 30 years of experience inside a box, putting them into packs and racks and now contributing as a key partner in the paradigm of electricity where transport is a key aspect, industrial applications are a key aspect, and yet consumer electronics continues very, very interesting. So new opportunities, and frankly, an opportunity in a lifetime for us alive right now to do good and do well. Thank you, uh, Christina. Thank you very much. Uh, Ricardo, let's, let's come uh, to you. Obviously, the battery boom is a global phenomenon, so it makes sense that an international organization like the World Bank Group is paying close attention. And uh, as the Senior Director for Energy and Extractives, um, this is, uh, I understand, close uh, to what you're looking at. Share with us the perspective of the World Bank. Why is this important and why have you, uh, why have you shown your support to the Global Battery Alliance? Please. Well, thank you very much, Georg. Thank you to everybody. Certainly, on batteries, we are potentially at the same point where we were with the wind and solar 20 years ago. So really, the potential is huge. But let's think about what we do at the World Bank. I mean, we talked about China, Europe as a European initiative for batteries, the United States, North America is very advanced, but a lot of developing world is not advancing on batteries. And batteries are key to the developing world. Think about how many, first of all, there are one billion people without access to electricity, but there are far more people with access to electricity, which is limited to three, four, five hours per day. There are people who have access to electricity, but they have very expensive diesel. So it, batteries can, on off-grid, can certainly improve access in a terrible way. Can you think in a little village in Africa, what is the difference between having energy during the day and having energy during the day, during the day in six hours every night? Then on grid. If this is only the off-grid. Think about Africa again. I could talk about mega cities in Asia, mega cities in uh, Latin America. There are at the moment seven mega cities in Africa. There will be in 2030 10 mega cities. Mega cities define every city with more than 10 million people in it. So th think about local pollution, not only global, local pollution due to the use, the utilization of fossil fuels. Batteries through electric vehicle could very much help reducing local pollution. And let's be frank, batteries on on-grid systems are incredibly important to avoid curtailment, uh, power sheds, and so on and so forth. Batteries are a key element for the stabilization of any on-grid systems. So this is why it is so important for the World Bank. Then we have to think about the whole cycle of batteries. As my colleague said before, the, before me, cobalt, lithium are very, very important to, to are very important components to batteries nowadays. Well, cobalt is not found very, very in many countries in the world. Lithium, it is far more. And, you know, there are always very important things about policy making. That's why I have to say I have two hats here. Not only I'm the head of energy extractives at the World Bank, I'm also the chair, the co-chair of the executive board of the Global Batteries Alliance. So you have to think about that there is a public concern. How is cobalt sourced? How is lithium sourced? So, I mean, are we sure that the countries that are, have been well endowed with these resources are going to benefit from them? Is it going to be sustainable? So I think there is a lot of work, and I have to say we found an amazing membership and team in the uh, Global Batteries Alliance thinking exactly about this, how to make sure that we can develop batteries from mining to recycling in a sustainable way, because it would be interesting to solve maybe the climate change equation and having a problem on the other side of the equation. I have to say that's what I found that there is a great membership at the GBA, at the Global Batteries Alliance. I think we have to improve, we have to increase the membership on the public side. I think the private is working well. More help from Asia, from Asia probably is needed. We need more of the public side because we need a lot of regulation, a lot of policy making to accelerate the deployment of these, I have to say, fantastic uh, technology. So we are all very much motivated and we hope to do our very, very best, not only for the benefit of the few, but for the benefit of 
of many of us. It's, this is really a public good. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. And we have uh, a fifth invisible uh, panelist here with us. Um, so Alicia Barcena, the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, wanted to be here today. Unfortunately, she was pulled away and has to be with the, with the UN Secretary General, which of course we all understand. However, um, it's very nice uh, that Martin has agreed to read a short statement uh, by Alicia um, for the benefit of all, so you don't have to miss her too much. So Please. I, give, I give my male voice to Alicia. So the ECLAC supports also the initiative and highlights the potential of, um, for the developing of battery value chain in Latin America. It will convene jointly with the Forum and the GBA um, a meeting in the headquarters at Santiago uh, de Chile um, in um, convening multiple key stakeholders from the supply chain uh, side, but also from the demand side of the value chain to further discuss uh, these opportunities um, with particular emphasis on electromobility related to the public transportation in, in Latin America. And we are very happy about this local um, initiative because at the very end we have to bring this also on the local floor. It's not only a global topic, but also very much in the application a local topic. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if we have any uh, questions from the audience. Um, can I see a show of hands if you have a question? The gentleman there in the back. Uh, if you could, for the sake of the online audience, identify yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marco Engman. I'm with German uh, Newswire um, TPAFX. And uh, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, one from, uh, from Ms. Lampe Onorut. Um, you talked about lithium ion technology. In, in general, if I got that right, what do you think of uh, solid state technology? When c could it be uh, the next uh, driver of, of battery technology? And um, then one question for Mr. Brudermiller. Um, we heard about cooperation models to, um, with car makers. Where do you see your share of value added in the, in the value chain? Thank sure. you. Please. So first on uh, lithium ion versus state, solid state or any other uh, newsworthy technology. So lithium ion, in my opinion, will take uh, the lion's share of where we're heading. And the reason is very simple. There is a lot of innovation in the pipeline. There are established supply chains and manufacturing channels. There are established use models. And we know as, a, as an industry and as a consumer body, quite a bit about how to integrate lithium ion. There is 30 years of trust, and there is enormous supply chain basically backing this up, including automation and equipment. So to basically displace that at any range will take 10, 15 years. In addition, of course, as an innovator, uh, I am excited about all new ideas, and solid state is one of those that hold great promise. But as an innovator, I also know I have some innovation on nickel cathodes, for example, with cobalt material that are 20 years old and that are just coming into the main market now. It takes a long time from concept to mass production to qualifying into these applications. And typically, a battery technology starts on smaller platforms. We are looking at such an enormous growth right now. So we will actually need the supply chain and the manufacturing body and the wisdom on product definition quite a bit to satisfy the need. So in summary, super excited about solid state and other technologies that are also attempting to solve these problems. We need new inventions. We need new ways to think about all these problems. But there's also a very rich and solid development line for lithium ion alone. So I think lithium ion will probably be around for the rest of my life, however young I, may, I am. <laughs> and I think it's just interesting to note, lead acid is still a technology that is investigated at all major academies these days. It was invented 1850. Yeah, but Christina, I think uh, the lithium ion battery potential is by far not exploited. There is huge innovation capa um, capacity in there. And this is also the reason why it is interesting for us as the chemical industry in BSF. The value chain has made basically three steps. You produce the material, then the cell, and then the battery. So BASF is very much focused on the, the battery materials, and with this, with emphasis on the so-called CUM, which is the cathode anode mater uh, active material, which is determining very much the energy density and capacity of the battery. 
It is also by far the most expensive part of a battery, can up to be 70% of the value of a battery at the very end. And as I just mentioned, this, this is nickel cobalt, uh, partly also manganese and, and also alumina containing materials. Um, very sophisticated, I have to say. You need a very fine balance. You need to um, manage uh, coatings, um, size of the pellets, and, and all that. And you can influence very much the properties. You want a battery that is charging fast. You want to have a battery that is has high, high energy intensity. And this is also where the automotive companies differentiate at the very end, because you have high luxury cars with a lot of uh, capacity. You need, on the other hand, batteries that are cheap for the uh, lower class um, um, cars. And so we are working on these materials, not only scaling them up now, because we expect a rather fast growing demand in these materials, but we also cater the distinct needs, innovation needs of our customers. So we are stepping in this business. As I said, it's a very, very fast growing uh, business, also a very exciting one, where we shape with our customers, the automotive industry, uh, that this makes its way and makes a fast way into uh, civilization. Thank you very much. And I have to confess, I've never heard uh, uh, people speak about batteries with such passion. So we <laughs> definitely picked the right people uh, for this panel here today. Uh, I, I can say that. I think we have a question here in the front row. If you could wait for the microphone, it's, it's on its way. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, the panelist. This is Angela. I'm, I'm working for Chinese Digital Media Corsina. And I heard that all of you talk about the supply chain of battery production, but I always have one question um, in the head. It's about how could you make sure that by calculating the whole uh, production line of the battery, that the battery will cause less pollution than consuming petrol and oil? Uh, because I'm not uh, a, s a specialist in this field. so. And uh, the second question, especially for um, Dean Lin Bo Chang, you mentioned a lot about the electric cars in China. And we all know that now we sold a lot of uh, like 1 million, 2, two million uh, electric cars in China. But for how to recycle all these batteries in the end, uh, Actually, still an open question, but there will be the use of the batteries in a couple of years, and we will see a big problem ahead of us. So, will you have a better solution for this? Thank you. Maybe I ask you for, uh, answer your first questions about um, the the life cycle and the CO2 footprint. You are totally right that the materials partly are very energy intensive. So it is first depends on how you produce it. I think it is very wisely to um, partly use renewable energies in the production of the materials. And then the second part, and that comes with the innovation, it's about the lifetime. First of all, we have to increase that the battery uh, and the car runs for quite a while. And then there is also the opportunity of a second use, um, which then extends the lifetime of a battery further. And then last but not least, you have also to look into the recycling which also helps to reduce the overall footprint of CO2. So there, there are still a lot of opportunities, but you are absolutely right. It has to be taken care about that. Thank you. Uh, the about the <coughs> yeah, the China has a lot of uh, electric vehicle at this point, but still very little, actually. We are thinking about by 2025, maybe 10 million, possibly. Okay. At this, at this point, uh, we get one million per year, later on probably two million per year because it's really uh, going very fast. Then the issue you raised, uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's a good one, it's a good question. Uh. Um, uh, I, I agree that with Martin that uh, the, we don't need to worry about it because uh, we can use electric vehicle and after that we can put into the together with the distribution of solar. So that, you know, on and on, uh, it can be utilized uh, for certain periods of time. And finally, we can go for recycling. So I think that the issue is not really as big as uh, uh, we, we anticipated at this moment as compared to nuclear waste. That is, uh, you know, uh, you cannot have a secondary use or the third at this, at this point that we, it's not feasible. But for the battery that we can see that, in fact, uh, that should be the case to improve the efficiency and economy of the, of the battery. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to, to add something to the sustainability question, maybe, Ricardo? Well, just to say that, you know, even the mining industry nowadays talk about 
smart mining, so the use of more renewables in mining and in the, uh, let's say, refining of the mining products. So I think that from this viewpoint, certainly there is a lot of space for improvement from the very beginning of the, of the chain to the very end. So I'm quite uh, optimistic. Yeah, I can only say from the manufacturing side of batteries in general, there is a lot of lead principles and ISO principles that are being pulled in with lots of experience. Again, the lithium-ion battery industry is quite mature at this time and has already gone through multiple revisions of efficiency improvements. And it's, it's very appropriate at the World Economic Forum to say it's actually driven by economics. So it's cheaper to recycle solvents, it's cheaper to have high efficiency, and you basically the industry as a whole, including its supply chain, is getting very good at yield. Thank you very much. And uh, mindful of the time and of the packed schedules of our panelists, we have to come to an end soon. But I want to point out one thing. Uh, the lady from Sina asked about what happens after the life cycle of the battery. And in 10 minutes right here at this very place, we'll have a press conference on electronic waste. So you might just stay here. Um, so you see, it's a, it's a complex issue. It, it, it re requires uh, everybody from the multi-stakeholder community to pitch in. And uh, we're very happy that we have, uh, with the Global Battery Alliance, such a strong uh, commitment and such a strong uh, set of multi-stakeholder activity. Thank you very much for being here in the room. Thank you very much for watching. And a big thank you to our panel uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.